Welcome back to Critical Accounting. My name is Cameron Graham, Professor of Accounting at the Schulich School of Business. In this video, I'm going to teach you all about financial statement analysis. It's a hugely important topic, and I want to make sure that you understand not just how to do the calculations that are involved, but how to use them, how to interpret them, how to generate meaning with the results. So let's go. We're going to look at the context in which you find the financial statements of a company, which is the annual report. And then I'll discuss some basic principles of financial statement interpretation. We'll look at some techniques to get a high level view of the statements. Then looking closer using ratio analysis to dig into some of the details. And then I'll talk about putting all of these pieces together into a full interpretation of a company's financial statements. If you're working in this course, you should be downloading the financial statements for Saputo from 2015 and a corresponding spreadsheet. So you'll be able to practice the calculations that we're doing here. For those of you without access to those files, just listen in and see what you can learn. Annual reports are, uh, they're, no, to put it bluntly, they're a propaganda exercise. They are designed to persuade. And if you are uncertain of whether that's true, you might want to consider that picture on the right there. That comes from the cover of the annual report of Canadian oil sands, one of the worst polluters in the world. All of the tar sands companies are terrible polluters of the environment. And uh, to put a picture of a nice little bird there, albeit that his legs are entrapped, it creates a, an image of the company that is quite at odds with the reality of its performance. As my father used to say, using an Air Force expression, an ounce of image is worth a pound of performance. So the image management, the impression management that goes on with the annual reports is sometimes maybe a little bit over the top. Let's look at how the accounting numbers tie into all of this. The production of annual reports is something you have to keep in mind. It's very professionalized. Everything is very carefully worded. There's a lot of wordsmithing goes into phrasing things exactly right, trying to avoid any possible misinterpretation that could lead to results that the company doesn't want to see in terms of, you know, its stock price or unfavorable publicity for the company. And then on top of that, you've got the fact that the production of annual reports is heavily standardized because every company watches what its competitors are doing and tries to make sure that they basically fall in line with industry practices. You don't want to stand out for your annual report. You want to make sure that it attracts positive attention, but you don't want to do anything that's too risky and attract negative attention. Companies tend to repeat what they did the year before and just modify it as little as possible to keep things on track. So there's a lot of copy and paste of text. And then of course, there's the fact that these companies rely on PR firms to do a lot of the production. So when you've got a body of knowledge amongst the, the PR experts on how to produce an annual report, and that gets shared from company to company, you get a lot of standardization as a result. The contents of an annual report starts out with lots and lots of pages of glossy self-advertisement. I don't see these in the security filings that go directly to regulators, but when you look at the polished annual report that is distributed widely kind of as an advertising vehicle for the company, there's pages and pages of, of what looks like a commercial for the company. You have a message from the CEO. You have a section called the MDNA, the management discussion and analysis. I always caution my students to look at that last. You want to go into the financial statements and dig into them and trying to develop some questions of your own for what's going on. And by digging into those first and then going to the MDNA and also out to the internet to look at what else has been said about the company, you begin to take control of the production of knowledge for yourself about this company rather than starting with the MDNA and adopting from the get-go the line of thinking that management wants you to take. And there's a reason why the MDNA appears before the audit to financial statements. The managers want to shape your interpretation before you even get to them. So something you can do for yourself is to start with the financial statements and dig into those first and then go to the MDNA. Most annual reports are of course going to list the board of directors. Part of the impression management here is to show you how experienced and astute the board of directors is and how meaningful the governance practices of the company are in order that you might trust the financial statements more. It's always worth looking at the diversity or lack thereof on the board of directors. Maybe it's not quite as bad as it used to be 50 years ago, but you'll still see an awful lot of people on the boards of directors who look a lot like me, white males. The MDNA 
in the annual report discusses the performance of the company in comparison with the rest of the industry. And it breaks down the performance of the company by the different operating entities of the company, especially if it's a diverse corporation with lots of subsidiaries in different countries or for different product lines or different service lines. The performance of each of those entities will be broken down for you. They'll provide additional financial information. And by additional, I mean non-GAAP measures. Principles of accounting are conservative and are restrictive on what the company can say. So in the MDNA, outside of the financial statements themselves, you'll find measurements that are not proper accounting, not approved accounting, that are designed to help highlight the things that the management wants you to pay attention to and distract from the things they want you to ignore. One of the things that the MDNA will also do is highlight the risks and uncertainties in the financial statements and the risks faced by the company. That can be quite useful in helping you to understand what it is that's going on with the company. Keep in mind that, again, a lot of the phrases that are used in that section are going to be heavily standardized across the industry and may be less revealing than you'd want them to be. Let's turn now to the basic principles of financial statement interpretation. I'm going to be talking about reframing and producing tension in your analysis, the importance of looking at accounting policies, and the concept of earnings quality. Reframing is a concept that we use at Schulich that we borrow from one of our former professors, the esteemed Professor Gareth Morgan. And what it involves is trying to change the frame of reference that you're given on a particular problem in order to include new information or focus in on aspects of it that may have escaped you before. By changing the frame of reference with a set of financial statements, you are altering the window that the corporation has set up for you to look through. And so one of the ways you can do that is to produce external comparisons, right? So the corporation says we had 6% profit this year. That's great. You can look at the average for the industry and find out how that compares. You could benchmark the company against a leader in the industry to see whether that 6% profit margin is actually all that good. It might be better than you expected. It might be worse when you look at this other information, but it does allow you to interpret it independent of what the company is saying. You can also set up internal comparisons, and this is where a lot of financial statement interpretation work is done by doing different kinds of analysis that we'll dig into shortly. But these internal comparisons allow you to juxtapose or compare one piece of information in the financial statements with something else in order to produce new meaning. These techniques are helpful in producing a close reading of the financial statements, looking at it bit by bit, trying to compare the little details with the overall impression, and learning to think critically about these things that are being said by the company. One of the things you want to do is look for contradictions, look for missing information, and try to figure out what the importance of those contradictions or the missing information might be. I like to think of financial statement interpretation as a process of producing tension. So if you think of the difference between deduction and induction, deduction is the classic Sherlock Holmes kind of approach to logic. You have these general principles. We have a particular kind of idea of how the company should be expected to behave. And from that, we will look for specifics about the company. So we think about the industry, the overall economy, and then we develop expectations of what the company should be revealing in its financial statements and compare what is actually there with what we expected. An inductive approach is looking at the specific details that are in the financial statements and working backwards up to general conclusions. So we dig into the financial details of the company and begin to ask questions about what we're seeing and develop hypotheses, right? So we see, for instance, that inventory has gone up. Ha, ah, that could be because they are producing a lot more inventory in order to stock up for an expansion, or it could be because they overproduced and weren't able to sell. So those are two separate hypotheses about the same little fact that we observed. And then we can look elsewhere in the financial statements and in the MDNA and look at what analysts have said about the company to see whether our hypotheses were correct or which of them is most plausible. So the idea here is to produce some tension between the different aspects of the information, working from the top down, the bottom up in order to find contradictions and explore those or exploit those in order to evaluate the story that management is trying to tell. 
Another thing you need to do when looking at the financial statements is to examine the accounting policies. And this is something that is often overlooked or done superficially by people doing financial statement analysis. One of the things you have to keep in mind is when you look at the accounting policies that are listed in the notes to the financial statement, the company's not going to highlight something and say, hey, this is different than last year. You have to go back and look at what they said last year. A clause by clause comparison of the accounting policies from last year to this year will help you see if there's any particular change. If a company does highlight the fact that there is a change in accounting policies, oftentimes that's worth wondering whether they're perhaps taking advantage of this policy change in order to accomplish something with their accounting measures, because that would allow them to blame the change on this mandated change in policies. But certainly when you have a change in the way that a company amortizes its assets or something like that, you are going to want to know why does this particular policy change and not all the other ones? And also if they're adopting a change, why is it being adopted this year instead of some other year? What are the advantages to the company of doing it this year? And of course you can do an external comparison. You can ask why these particular policies might be different from a competitor's policies. All this said, of course, the accounting policies tend to be fairly general. You may find out how they amortize their assets. A particular class of assets might be amortized using the straight line method, but they might not disclose all of the factors that are used to determine residual value of the assets or those sorts of things. So there's not as much disclosed in the accounting policies as we might like, but certainly whenever there's a change, it's worth paying attention and asking yourself why and why now. One of the things you want to do when you're looking at financial statements is try to evaluate the quality of the earnings. Now you'd think that every dollar was created equal, but uh, there is a difference between profits or earnings that are transitory and those that are permanent. So the idea of permanence in earnings is basically that the earnings that you're looking at are expected to recur in the future, that they are a good signal of what's going to happen in the future. Transitory earnings, on the other hand, are earnings that are produced by one-time events. So you've got restructuring costs, you've got asset write-downs or write-offs, gains and losses on disposals of assets, and so on. And all of these things can produce momentary or one-time changes in the earnings, either up or down, making the information quality of that number a little less useful for predicting the future. You also want to look at whether the earnings are subject to undue management influence by changes in accounting policy, as we just saw, or by the exploitation of hidden reserves. That's a concept that we'll look at in more detail when we get into looking at things like accounts receivable. But it's basically the capacity of management to set some buffer room aside from one year to another and then use that buffer when it's most advantageous to them. Let's take a high level view of financial statements. Common size analysis is basically taking all of the numbers in a given column of a financial statement and converting them to a percentage of the largest number on that statement. So on the balance sheet, that's going to be the total assets. You express everything in a given column as a percentage of the total assets for that year. On the income statement, the largest number is going to be at the top, the revenue. So you express everything as a percentage of the revenue for that year. What this allows you to do is it allows you to compare entities of different sizes. So uh, two companies have a million dollars worth of profit, which one is better? If you earned a million dollars worth of profit off of $5 million worth of revenue, that's a pretty healthy profit margin. But if you earn a million dollars off of a billion dollars worth of revenue, that's uh, not necessarily very exciting performance. By converting the profit to a percentage of the revenue, that highlights the difference between those two otherwise similar numbers. In interpreting a, a common size analysis, you want to think about the business model of the company. And you want to be looking for items that you know matter the most. What are you going to focus on? The kinds of things that you're looking for would be the things that are most relevant to that particular kind of company. You can also look at changes in weight from one year to another, although the trend analysis that we're going to look at next is probably better suited for that. And you always want to try to explain what you're seeing in terms of the business strategy of the company. Does it make sense that these particular numbers have these particular weights? You want to assess the numbers that you're seeing in terms of the power of the stakeholders and the underlying economy. Now, these are things that pertain to every aspect of financial statement analysis. But I'm bringing them up here because this is the first set of numbers we're going to be looking at in this lecture. So let me give you an example of a common size analysis. 
Here's the balance sheet for a company by the name of Saputo for 2015. And what I've done is I've taken the first half of the balance sheet and done a common size analysis where I compare every number to the total assets. So for instance, if you look at the cash and cash equivalents here, it is expressed as a percentage of the total assets for that year, and it is 1%. And that's pretty steady across all of those years. Let's look at another one. If you look at the total for the current assets for the year and express it as a percentage of total assets, you see that it's 29% this year. Previous year, that same figure was actually 30% of the total assets number for that year. Very slight change. This particular example, you think that it's not very informative because nothing changes very much. However, I think the fact that it doesn't change very much is very interesting. To me, this is an indication of the uh, very careful management of this particular company. They do a pretty good job of producing consistent results year to year. And that's why you don't see uh, dramatic changes. We're going to look at other aspects of this company and some of the other examples, and we'll see if there's anything else we can learn. But uh, from this particular statement, when you do a common size analysis, it looks very stable. A trend analysis is when you look from left to right across the columns. The common size analysis, because you're looking up and down a column, is often called a vertical analysis. The trend analysis is sometimes referred to as a horizontal analysis because you're looking across the row. And you're looking for indications of growth or decline in a particular line. So not a change in relation to other numbers in the same column, but a change in relation to previous years. When you're trying to interpret a trend analysis, you're going to be looking for anomalies. Why is the inventory number changing, but the accounts receivable didn't? Uh, you're looking for conflicting trends, therefore, within the company. And you can also compare the trends that you're seeing with this company to the trends that you observe in the financial statements of another company, if you take the time to do the trend analysis for them as well. And you're always going to want to ask what possible reasons could explain the changes that you're seeing from one year to another. So let's look at an example of this. Here's the trend analysis for Saputo again in 2015. What can we observe here? Well, there's a few things that are interesting. One of the things that we're going to come back to is right here, you've got the fact that you don't actually get told what the gross margin of the company is. You're never told what the cost of goods sold is on this financial statement. So that's kind of strange. The other things that you want to look at here are the fact that if you compare each revenue is a percentage of the 2013 column. Let's work from right to left. So of course, 2013 divided by itself is one. 2014 divided by the 2013 number is 1.27. And 2015 divided by the 2013 number is 1.46, right? So each of these numbers here is being expressed as a percentage of that base year. And the reason for doing this is it allows you to highlight just how much the company is changing in a given line from the base year. And it reveals interesting things. For example, the revenues are up by a factor of 1.46 or 46% would be another way to express that over two years. But the earnings, if you look at the bottom line here, the earnings are only up 27% over that period. So, you know, if you're looking at these numbers here for the net earnings right down at the bottom, the growth seems to be pretty nice. It's a fairly healthy net profit for the company, and it's gone up considerably since 2013, but it hasn't kept pace with the overall growth in revenues of the company. So one of the things you're going to want to look for then is where were there changes in the company's expenses that might have pulled back some of the growth in net earnings? For example, one of the things you can look at right here is that the operating costs grew by 49%, 1.49 compared to revenue. So that's going to have an impact on the net income number at the bottom. And uh, you have to watch for the numbers that are actually important, the ones that are material, because one of the numbers that's going to catch your eye over here in the trend analysis section is this one right here. That's a huge growth. So compared to the 2013 number for that line, it's grown by almost a factor of five, almost five times as big. But then you go over and you look at the fact that these numbers are quite small in comparison to the rest of the uh, numbers on the statement. And uh, you realize it's just not a very significant number to be paying attention to. So unless you're actually trying to do an analysis of their finances, uh, the way that they're financing the company and the uh, interest payments that they're making and so forth, you're not going to gain too much information from that because it's 
although it's growing dramatically, it's a very small number to begin with. Trend analysis is always going to cause you grief if you try to do the impossible. So you notice, for instance, that right here, there is no number for the 2013 year. So there was no gain or disposal of a business unit in 2013. So that number was blank or in other words, zero. So if you try to take that number and divide it by the base year, right, you're going to get a divide by zero error. So uh, I've just left those numbers out of the Excel spreadsheet right there because they would not be informative. Here's another number that we just looked at that's quite small compared to the other numbers of that on that line. And so you get some pretty dramatic numbers here. So this is really not a very useful kind of analysis tool to use when you're talking about small numbers in the base year. So yeah, it's worth looking at at any rate and you can gain some sense of appreciation for how the company is moving forward over time. All right, let's look at ratio analysis. I like to categorize the different ratios into different tool sets. And it's useful to think of your overall approach to analyzing the company's statements using ratio analysis in three ways. You want to assess the financial position of the company, the financial performance of the company, and the cash flows. One way of thinking of this would be to think about evaluating an athlete who is preparing for the Olympics. The financial position of the company corresponds to the fitness of the athlete. You expect a weightlifter to be strong. You expect the marathon runner to be lean. And if they've got the wrong body mass for the sport that they're in, they're not necessarily going to do very well. That allows you to assess what the potential of the company is. The financial performance would be akin to the actual performance of the athlete in their event. A sprinter, how fast did they run? A weightlifter, how much did they lift? How did they use their resources in order to achieve a particular performance? Cash flows, if we can extend the metaphor a little more crudely, cash flows would be akin to looking at the diet of the, of the athlete. Are they taking in the right fluids and the right food types in order to produce the best performance? So the financial position of the company, what resources does the company have to meet the obligations that it's got and also to achieve the strategy that it has in mind. It's useful to distinguish between liquidity and solvency when you're looking at the financial position of the company. Illiquidity is not having enough cash to meet the operational needs of the company over the short term. Insolvency is when you don't have enough resources to pay off all of your debts. That's a longer term kind of a problem. It's important to realize that a company can be solvent, but can still die from illiquidity. If you have the prospects of producing enormous profits by the end of the year, but halfway through the year, you run out of cash to pay your employees. Everything will come to a grinding halt. Both of these situations are often resolved by negotiations as opposed to some legal or regulatory rule. And the results of these situations tends to depend on who has the power. Might be the bank, might be the union, might be some supplier that has a particular hold over the company and can achieve some kind of an outcome that favors them. To look at liquidity is to answer the question of whether there's enough cash in the company to pay the bills. And by cash, we need a looser definition of liquid assets. If you look at the current ratio, which is the most basic of these, you're comparing the current assets to the current liabilities, the current assets being all the assets that are going to convert into cash or cash savings this year, the current liabilities being all the obligations that are coming due this year. And if you've got enough current assets to cover or meet all of those liabilities, you're in good shape. The bigger the number, the better, but you certainly want it to be greater than one. A quick ratio is a more restricted look at this uh, similar concept, but you're only including those assets that are already liquid. So cash, liquid investments, and accounts receivable that you would expect customers to pay without too much chasing them down. Now, since the current assets are listed in order of liquidity, you tend to have the cash and the accounts receivable up at the top, and then partway down the list would be the inventory. And the idea is that anything from inventory on down is considered illiquid because you actually have to do a lot of work to convert the inventory into cash. You've got to go out and sell that stuff and it's not easy. And uh, below the inventory is often things that are not going to turn into cash. For instance, prepaid expenses, no matter how long you wait, they're never going to turn into cash. They're not included in the quick assets. This ratio is often less than one, but you want it to be as healthy as you can. And certainly a change in the quick ratio from one year to another might indicate that things are getting dramatically worse or better in terms of the ability of the company to pay its bills.
let's look at an example of using the current ratio and the quick ratio to analyze the liquidity of a company. We're looking at Saputo again for 2015. And for the current ratio right here, what I've done is I have calculated the ratio of the current assets in each year to the current liabilities. And the thing that sticks out here is this number here, jumping up to 1.7 from 1.1 in the previous year. What is driving that? I suspect if you eyeball the lines here, you'll notice that the inventory number right there is up quite a bit compared to the, the first year. That's one of the things that would be changing the amount of the current assets in relation to the current liabilities. Are we noticing any drop in liabilities that would also drive that? Well, there's one right there. You've got a change from the previous year from 310 down to hundred and some odd thousand dollars in the bank loans. And if you look into note nine, you will see a little more information about that. Let's point it out right there. So if you add up the assets that are considered quick, then that would be the next thing to do. Let me just clear these things out of here. The quick assets are those that are considered to be more liquid than inventory. So here you've got your cash and cash equivalents and your accounts receivable. For this particular company, there's nothing left, but the inventory is considered not to be a quick asset because it takes work to go sell it. And anything that is listed lower than inventory would be considered even less liquid. For example, prepaid expenses, you're not gonna be able to convert that into cash. What that is is money that you already spent in a previous year that is going to save on the payment of bills later on, but it's never going to turn into cash for you to pay other obligations that are coming up. So what have we got here in terms of the uh, quick assets? We have the totals down here that I've calculated, which is simply the sum of the uh, two numbers up at the top there in each column. And that gives us the uh, calculation then of the quick ratio. And you'll see that the quick ratio is rising very slightly from 0 0.5, 0 0.5 up to 0 0.7. And so that's contributing to the increase in the current ratio, but fairly stable overall. So what does this tell you? Uh, it tells you that this company is fairly liquid and uh, improving in its liquidity. One of the common calculations that's done to analyze the ability of a company to deal with the debt levels that it's got is called the interest coverage ratio. And I've shown you a couple of ways of calculating it here. The point of showing you two ways of doing it is to try to wean you off of the idea that there's always one accepted way of doing these calculations. Often there's variations on each of these calculations that we're looking at today, and you need to be aware of the nuances and decide which one is most appropriate for you, given the company you're looking at. So let's look at how these calculations play out. The general idea, looking at the earnings statement for Saputo for 2015, is to start with the net earnings and then back up to some point above the interest expense to see how much of the margin of the company is left over when you get to that point in the statement. And here is the uh, interest expense right there, interest on long-term debt. But curiously, you've got this other line here, which is other financial charges. If you look into note 13, you'll see that other financial charges uh, is not really specified in much detail. That could be commissions that are paid on the issuing of debt, for instance. If you're looking at issuing bonds, there might be a lot of overhead involved in getting those arranged and floated on the stock market. Whether that's considered an interest expense or not is certainly subject to interpretation. And you need to think about what that line means when you look at the calculation that you end up with here. So what else have we got here in terms of the calculation? Well, if you just look at the net earnings number, and back up to the point that we we're just looking at interest and long-term debt, the interest coverage ratio that you have then is basically going to be the subtotal to this point, right? So taking all of these things down to this point here, what would be the total that you've got at that point in terms of profit margin uh, divided by the $54 million figure there? Uh, that would give you a calculation at this point of 17 for 2015 and slightly lower for 2014 and slightly higher for 2013. So it means that in 2013, they had a better ability to cover the interest expense as largely due to the fact that it's quite a bit smaller there. You can see that number there. And then in 2014, it dropped, 2015, it went back up. So that's all well and good. Let's look at the alternative specification for this. Let me just get rid of these highlights and go to the next version of the calculation. And that's the one that 
looks at EBITDA. That's right there. Earnings before interest, amortization. The D in EBITDA is depreciation, restructuring, and income tax. So the variation you've got here, of course, is that you're not looking at purely EBITDA. You've also got this restructuring cost right in there. That's actually a gain. All of these things are problematic to me. If you want to back up to this point and ignore the assets of the company and what it took to get to this point, you're basically ignoring all the past dependencies of the company that it went through in order to get to the point where it could earn the revenues that it has. I don't like the EBIT diversion because these amortization expenses are there for a reason in generally accepted accounting principles. They are a commitment to understanding the history of the company. When you include depreciation and amortization expenses, you're acknowledging the fact that none of these revenues were free. The company had to invest to produce them. And if you're going to do something like an EBITDA calculation and divide that by the interest expense, you're really ignoring a lot of the company's history. What difference does it make? In our case, you can see that it's not much different. It was higher in 2013, lower in 2014, and up slightly in 2015. So in the grand scheme of things, we're not seeing too much difference between those two variations of the calculation. What we want to ask then is, are these changes being driven by increases in revenue, reductions in operating expense, or is it simply a change in the interest expense that's driving these? All of these are components in the calculation, and you need to dig further in order to interpret them properly. The concept of leverage is asking, what has the company done in order to generate the assets that it has? You can generate assets by selling stock on the stock exchange and using the proceeds to invest in assets. You can also generate assets by borrowing money and producing more because you've got more assets at your disposal now. So this is leveraging the equity of the company to amplify the results that you've got. And the interesting thing that you have to keep in mind here is that it really all depends. The effect of leverage really depends on whether the marginal return on assets is going to be greater or less than the interest rate on the debt that you're incurring. Now, by marginal ROA, I mean, what's the return that you're going to get on the next bunch of assets that you buy with that debt that you borrow? If you are thinking at all about any particular kind of industry, whether it's a shoe company or a, a mining company, you'll know immediately that assets are not smooth in terms of their acquisition. You don't get just a linear progression of assets and borrowing another 5% will give you another 5% assets. What you have is you've got a certain amount of assets that are necessary. And then in order to get a greater return, you have to actually invest a considerable chunk of money in a new factory or a new product launch or something like that. So this is not a simple concept, the marginal ROA, but what I'm trying to show here is that the interest that you charge on your debt is going to have an impact on the results that you have. So as long as you are earning more with those assets than the interest rate that you're incurring, borrowing is going to increase your ROE. And if you have a lower return on your assets and interest rates, it's going to amplify your results as well, but it's going to amplify your negative results. You're actually going to be generating less profit than you need to cover the interest that you're incurring. And so the borrowing is going to decrease your return on equity. Keep this in mind. Leverage does not just produce more of a good thing. It can also produce more of a bad thing. If you're going to start looking at leverage, of course, you have to look at the overall capital structure of the company. How is the company financed? The simple calculations of debt to equity, for instance, are going to ignore a lot of the nuances of the capital structure of the company. So you want to look at what is the debt makeup? Is it bank loans? Is it bonds? Is it notes? Oftentimes notes are to one particular party and bonds might be floated on the stock exchange to a whole bunch of different stakeholders, different investors. So that changes the leverage of the debt holders over the company. You also want to look at the equity. Is the equity just a whole bunch of common shares that were sold? Or has the company retained a lot of earnings in order to build up its equity? Or is the equity made up of preferred shares as well? In which case the equity is split between the common shareholders and the preferred shareholders. And we're going to see how to factor that into the calculations that we're looking at next. So here's your solvency ratios. The debt to equity ratio is the most common one, and there's variations on this. And you have to think carefully about what you're doing with this. The traditional debt to equity calculation is just crude. You look at the total liabilities on the right side of the balance sheet and divide it by the total equity. A more sophisticated version is looking at the net debt. 
So you take the long-term debt of the company, that is not including the accounts payable, and you subtract the cash that's on the left-hand side of the balance sheet in order to arrive at a net debt figure. And this is supposed to indicate what the long-term obligations of the company are compared to the equity position of the company. That's an interesting way of doing things, but then you have to wonder, like, why just the cash? Why not also include the accounts receivable? As we saw in the calculation of the quick ratio, you considered accounts receivable to be a quick asset, so why not include that? And if you're going to include that, then why not also take into account the accounts payable? So it all begins to fall apart very quickly if you look at it too closely. But these are two different calculations, and if you're going to use one or the other, you need to understand why you're using that. And it's perhaps useful to look at both of them and compare them and see which one makes more sense for you, which one of these generates a more insightful picture of the company's debt and equity. The long-term debt to equity is a simpler version of the net debt. You're just looking at long-term debt rather than all of the current liabilities of the company, dividing that by equity. Again, just a variation on the theme. The other calculation that's shown here, debt to assets, is rather interesting because it's the only one you can use when the company's got a negative equity position. How do you get a negative equity position? Well, by selling a million dollars worth of shares and then proceeding to lose more than a million dollars in the first few years, you end up with a negative equity situation. The debt to assets calculation is always going to involve positive numbers. So it's useful to interpret trends from one year to another when one of those years might have had a negative equity situation. So just another tool to have in your arsenal as you're working through these solvency ratios. Here is the calculations for Saputo for 2015 and looking back the previous two years. The debt to equity ratio, as you can see here, is dropping over time. You want to ask why? Is it because the equity is going up or the debt is going down? Good question. Long-term debt to equity is the same pattern. Debt to assets ratio is fairly stable right there. So that suggests if the debt to assets ratio is fairly stable, then maybe what's changing here is the equity rather than the debt. But let's have a look more closely at the financial statements in order to understand what is driving those changes that we're observing. To look at the financial performance of the company, you are really asking not simply what did the company do, but what did it do given the resources that it has and also the opportunities that it has? You're trying to understand whether the company is able to produce those performances in relation to competitors. The picture that's shown there of the wheelchair racers is provocative for me because you, know, you would never want to compare a, a wheelchair athlete with an able-bodied athlete over 200 meters. There's just no way that the able-bodied athlete would be able to keep up with them. But perhaps over 100 meters, the person with two working legs might get off to a faster start. It does take a little bit of time to get the wheelchair up to speed. But once it's at speed, it will cruise way faster than an able-bodied runner can go. The most obvious thing to start with is the gross margin calculation, which is your sales minus cost of goods sold divided by the sales. So in other words, how much is left over just after you've factored out the cost of goods sold. You can do this as a raw calculation of gross profit or as a margin, a ratio, and that'll give you a percentage, which is why you've got the times 100 right there. These ratios are going to vary considerably by industry, and they're going to affect our interpretation of a lot of things on the financial statements. When you look at, for instance, a clothing company, a clothing store has very high margins. The cost of goods sold is very low compared to the selling price. Grocery stores, in comparison, have quite low margins. The cost of goods sold is very high compared to the price they take in. So to be profitable as a grocery store, you have to do different things than you do as a clothing store. Again, context matters in interpreting these numbers. This is the calculation for Saputo. The very first thing that you want to keep in mind, of course, with Saputo is they never do tell you on their financial statements what the cost of goods sold is. If you got the Saputo financial statements for 2015, I suggest you go looking at note four and just see how far you have to dig in order to find the cost of goods sold figure. But I've taken that and plugged it into the spreadsheet here, calculating the gross margin and the gross margin percentage. You can see that there's very little change for this company over time. It's a very stable company, quite profitable. A drop from 20% to 19% gross margin is insignificant for a company like Saputo because they're supplying milk products and cheese to grocery stores. For a grocery store, if its margins were lower, say three or 4%, then a drop from say 4% to 3% would be of greater concern 
Then Saputo's draw from 20 down to 19. The profit margin is the bottom line of the company. So you're just taking the net income figure at the bottom of the income statement, dividing it by the sales at the top of the income statement. The calculations for Saputo are fairly straightforward. And you can see again, it's a very stable company, not much change over time. And a company, by all appearances of the financial statements, seems to be quite well managed and quite stable. The return on assets calculation is really interesting to me because you have to really think about what's going into this calculation if you want to come up with an appropriate calculation. The simplest way to do this would be just to take the net income and divide it by your total assets. So there's two nuances in this calculation that I'm showing you here. The first is that you should really be using the average total assets on the bottom, not just the total assets at the end of the year. And that's because the income is something that was produced over the entire fiscal period. And the company did not have the total assets at the end of the year at its disposal during the year. Ideally, you would want to take some kind of an integral that would factor in the change in total assets on a daily basis, but that information is not available to you. The best you could do would be quarterly, a simple approximation of the assets that were at the disposal of the company throughout the year is to take an average of the total assets at the end and the total assets of the previous year to give an average for your denominator. That's, I think, something that really needs to be taken into account for all companies, especially where there is growth because the total assets could shift considerably from one year to the next. If the company is quite stable, there's no change in the total assets that's appreciable, then go ahead, use the ending total assets figure if you want. The same goes now for the nuances on the top of the calculation. I have added back to the net income figure, the after-tax interest expense. And I'm going to show you why this is done and exactly how it's done in the next slide. The calculation here is intended to isolate the return on assets. So the performance of the company compared to the assets at its disposal, isolate that from the way that those assets were obtained. So if the company obtained its assets through equity, that will produce a certain net income. If it obtained its assets through equity and debt, then that's going to produce a different net income figure because of the fact that net income also has the interest expense as a component. So let's look a little more closely at that calculation. Here's how the after-tax interest expense is calculated. This is a very crude example, but imagine that you've got a company that is facing an income tax rate of 20%. So if that company is entirely financed by equity, let's assume for a second that its earnings before you get to the interest and income tax line on the income statement is 1,000. It's got no debt, it's got no interest expense, and so it's got $1,000 left over. And the income tax on the $1,000 at 20% is 200. And therefore you have $800 of net income. Now imagine the identical company, but a version of it that's financed by debt. And it has a certain amount of interest. We're just going to say for the sake of argument that it's interest expense that year was 100. So that leaves only $900 of taxable income, right? So exactly the same company now has lower taxable income. 20% income tax on 900 is 180, which gives us a net income of 720. So both of these companies have produced exactly the same performance with their assets. The only difference is that one has incurred an interest expense. So it looks like the company on the right had a higher performance than the company on the left. And if you simply divided 800 by the assets, you would end up with a higher figure than if you divided 720 by the assets. So that's not a fair comparison, not a useful comparison, certainly. Let's, uh, for the sake of argument, add back the interest expense and see what happens. Well, if we add back the entire interest expense, then we overcompensate. We end up with a figure of 820. So now we're unfairly privileging the company that took on debt. What do you do? You calculate one minus the tax rate. In this case, the tax rate is 20%. One minus the tax rate then is 80%. And you multiply that by the interest expense. Here's the interest expense up here, 100. If you multiply those together, you've got 100 times 0.8 is 80. And if you add that back to the 720, you get 800. And now you've got a fair comparison. So this is how this after-tax interest calculation right here compensates in your calculation for whether or not the company had taken on debt. Now, obviously, if the company has very little debt and very low interest expenses, then this little nuance is not going to tell you too much. But if you are wanting to compare a company that's got heavy debt financing to another company that does not, 
This is a wrinkle in the ROE calculation you really should take into consideration. Here is the calculation for Saputo for 2015. The tax rate, notice here, we're getting it from note 14. Don't bother with the effective income tax expense. That is calculated by taking the income tax expense and dividing it by the taxable income. But that is so heavily influenced by factors related to the timing of tax payments that it's not really very useful to you. Dig into the notes, in this case, note 14, and look up what the statutory tax rate is for the company. And in this case, you can see it's been fairly consistent at around 28%. Uh, for this company, it's based in Quebec. The uh, after-tax interest expense then for the company is right here, factoring in that tax rate. And uh, you'll notice that when we do the calculation properly, we end up with a return on assets that is unchanged from one year to the next, indicating that the company is basically producing the same performance with its assets from year to year. The other thing to notice, of course, right here is that you don't have any calculation for that third year, and that's because you are using the average assets on the bottom. And if you only have three columns of numbers to work with, you are missing the piece of information to calculate the average assets in that initial column. So if this is 2015, 2014, 2013, you do not have in the spreadsheet the previous year's assets in order to do the calculation properly. Be aware that if you're just copying numbers in a spreadsheet, copying formulas across, you could end up with a, a very nasty error right in this spot right here, because you wouldn't necessarily notice that your calculation was picking up a big fat zero over in that column and distorting the denominator of the calculation. The return on equity calculation is looking not at what the managers did with the assets, but whether the investors are getting a good return on their investment. We're talking about the common shareholders here. So we factor out the preferred dividends of the company, any net income that the company produces is available to pay dividends to the shareholders. But if part of that has to go to the preferred shareholders first, we should factor that out. Oftentimes companies don't have any preferred shares, so that makes no difference. So check the capital structure of the company and the notes to the financial statements to find out whether there were any preferred dividends that you have to keep in mind here. And again, of course, you're wanting to use the average for exactly the same reasons as I just talked about with the ROA calculation. You want to use the average common shareholders equity. So the net income divided by that will give you these calculations that I'm going to show you for Saputo. There were no preferred dividends for the company and the ROE drops slightly from one year to the next, from 2014 to 2015. Why is that? Well, it could be that the net income dropped or it could be that the equity went up. So why is that? One of the things to think about is that the ROE is driven by the equity calculation and the equity calculation has the retained earnings in it. So you would expect that all things being equal, if the company continues to generate net income and retain that earning in its equity section, that if it doesn't do anything with that equity, if it doesn't reinvest in more assets, then it's going to continue to produce the same net income with the same assets, but the equity is going to grow and grow and therefore the ROE is going to decline. Here is a version of the ROE calculation that's interesting because it allows you to break the ROE calculation out into the various factors. What you've done here with this calculation is you've taken the ROE and breaking it into the profit margin, the asset turnover ratio, and the equity multiplier. You can see that if you were to calculate these as a multiplication, that the sales cancel each other out, the assets cancel each other out, you end up with profit divided by equity. So then that is your return on equity calculation in a nutshell. This is a simplistic version of it because it doesn't factor in some of the nuances that we've looked at, but it does help you understand what is driving the various components of the ROE that you're looking at. So here's the uh, DuPont analysis for Saputo. The profit margin is just profit divided by sales, very crude. And we saw before that the numbers are quite steady. We saw those 6%, 6%, 7% figures earlier. The next thing to look at then is the asset turnover ratio, which is the sales divided by the assets. So in other words, how often is the value of the assets being turned into sales? In this case, the asset turnover ratio has risen slightly from 1.4 up to 1.6. So it's generating more sales with the assets that it's got on average. And then combining those together, if you take the profit over sales times sales over assets, what does that give you? That gives you profit over assets, 
which is basically ROA. And you can see that the ROA calculation is quite stable over those years. This is going to be slightly different than the previous ROA calculation that we did because it doesn't have all the little nuanced wrinkles in it. This is just a quick and dirty method of looking at the ROA. But if you take that ROA then and multiply it by the equity multiplier, which is the assets divided by the equity, different than the other leverage calculations we looked at, right? This is assets divided by equity. So in other words, the equity that the company has, how effectively have they leveraged that into assets that they can use? So the equity multiplier, as you can see, is the one that changes quite a bit here, right? It goes from 2.3 down to 2.2 down to 1.9. And that is really the component for Saputo that's driving the drop in the return on equity calculation. So again, these ROE figures are not going to match exactly the ROE calculations that we did before but it does show that there is a tendency for it to drop and it does show us why. And it's because of the change in relationship between the assets and the equity. So what does that suggest? It means we need to look at, did they acquire more assets over time? Or is it simply that the equity is being driven up? And if so, why? Is the equity rising because they're selling shares? Is the equity rising because they are retaining earnings and not paying dividends? All of these explanations are possible. If you want to apply the DuPont analysis, you need to think about the features of the industry that the company is in. So for example, a luxury goods company is going to have a high profit margin. Grocery store is going to generate its profit off of low margins, but it's going to generate it by leveraging its assets and selling lots with those assets. And a bank would have a very high leverage because of course, most of its assets are offset by liabilities to its depositors. So in each of these industries, a different component of the DuPont analysis is going to be crucial to their success. Think about what is going on in this company and don't just interpret these numbers blindly. I remind you again, these calculations don't take into account any of the nuances that we built into the ROA and ROE calculations. They don't use averages in the denominators like average equity or average assets. And they don't handle those nuances like the after-tax interest or the preferred dividends in the ROA calculation. So keep in mind, it's crude, but it does give you a, a quick read on what might be going on with the company. Earnings per share, interesting calculation because it's susceptible to manipulation by the managers. The net income number is what you expect in the preferred dividends. We've seen this calculation before, net income minus preferred dividends. We saw that in the ROE calculation earlier. The problematic part here is the weighted average number of shares. So the weighted average is calculated by looking at the number of shares that were outstanding in the company over time. So if the company didn't sell or repurchase any shares, then that's going to be a constant number. But if the company issued shares partway through the year, then it depends on when it issued them, right? If it issued them towards the end of the year, then for most of the year, the number of shares was low. If it issued them at the beginning of the year, then for most of the year, the number of shares was high. So the weighted average simply takes into account the days on which the shares were issued or repurchased. And it's the repurchasing part that is the thing that is subject to manipulation because as we've seen with Apple earlier in the course, Apple is using its retained earnings and its borrowing to purchase back shares on the stock market, which drives up the earnings per share. So anytime you've got a company issuing shares or repurchasing shares, you have to ask, why are they doing this? Are the managers driving this decision or is it based on economic opportunities for the company? There's another little nuance here in terms of the two versions of the EPS calculation. You've got the basic and the fully diluted. Basic is using the weighted average number of outstanding shares on the bottom. The fully diluted is using the weighted average number of all possible shares. That is the one that is probably of more interest to shareholders because the dilution is what happens when you've got the possibility of, for instance, preferred shares in the company being converted into common shares. And that might be at the option of the preferred shareholder, or it might be at the option of the company. The same thing can happen with debt. You might have bonds that are issued that may or may not be converted into shares down the road. And you've got stock options that are being issued to the managers that one day will be turned into shares as well. So all of these possible conversions into common shares are included in the denominator when you're doing the fully diluted calculation. Very important to take those factors into account. Otherwise you don't know what you're buying.
Other common ratios, the price to earnings ratio, share price over earnings per share. Curious because the share price is driven by the market and the share price is also driven by the number of shares. This is what's called a simulacrum. The price to earnings ratio is very self-referential and uh, I'm not sure that I really understand fully what kind of information it provides to people. The dividend payout ratio is looking at the common dividends that were paid out of the net income. Just another calculation to show you whether a company is paying out the dividends that it could compared to another company. Common ratios, use them if they're useful to you. Uh, ignore them if they're not. Remember that anything can be a ratio, right? So you can take any two numbers on the financial statements and divide one by the other and come up with a ratio. It's really just a matter of whether that calculation makes sense in a particular circumstance. Some calculations are quite common within one industry, but of no value in another industry. An R&D company, a tech company would want to show you, or you would want to calculate for it, what its research expense is divided by the sales. So that will tell you whether the company is investing adequately in R&D. But keep in mind that if the company successfully invests in R&D, then it's going to capitalize those development costs and they're not going to show up as an expense. So what does a research expense ratio tell you? It could tell you that the company is spending an awful lot on research, like Apple is, and yet it's not able to capitalize those expenses because the research efforts are not successful. One could argue, if one was cynical, that uh, that is also the case for Apple, since most of its capitalization on the asset side of the balance sheet is coming from acquisitions, like when it buys beats. I don't know what to say about this other than to say that it requires an awful lot of interpretation. You can't simply look at the number and assume that a higher R&D ratio is better or a lower R&D ratio is better. Certainly, you do want to see a company investing in R&D if it is a company that relies on new technology in order to succeed. If it's a company that is very stayed and is simply milking a set of assets that are not going to go anywhere, they're not going to become obsolete, then spending money on R&D might be a mistake for that company. Again, context matters. Finally, let's look at cash flows. You can read the slide. <laughs> if you think of the diet of the company, you want to ask, where is the nutrition coming from? So there's lots of ways that a company can produce cash for its own use. In the long run, what you want is for it to be generating operating cash flows. We've looked at the cash flow statement interpretation before, so I won't go into it in any detail here, but you do want to think about whether the operations, the investing, or the financing activities of the company are the ones that are generating or using cash. And you want to interpret those in relation to the strategy of the company. So you can go back and listen to the slides on the cash flow statement if you want to get into more detail on that or refresh your memory. In interpreting the cash flow statement, you want to be asking critical questions, and that really it depends on the perspective that you're taking. What is it that you are trying to consider that the company needs to have cash for? From a union perspective, you might be interested in whether the company is generating enough money to pay the wages or to fund the pension plan. If you are thinking strategically about the company, you want to know whether it's able to fund a potential expansion. If you are looking at the capital structure of the company, you want to know whether the company is generating enough cash to pay off its debts. And if you are an investor who is relying on dividends, of course, you want to know whether it's going to have any money left over at the end of the day to pay you the dividends. So keep in mind, you're always going to be interpreting these cash flows in relation to a specific question that you have and also in relation to the company's strategy. One of the ways of looking at the cash flows of the company is to think about the operations. And this is a set of calculations that really only makes sense for a standard sort of company that produces goods because you've got this inventory turnover calculation in here that we'll look at. But essentially, you've got these three major components of your working capital. You've got the inventory, you've got the accounts receivable, and you've got the accounts payable. And so you can understand a lot about the company by looking at the way it takes advantage of each of these components. So the inventory turnover is going to be the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. Again, you need the average on the bottom because the cost of goods sold is for the entire year. And this will tell you how many times did it run through the inventory. This is going to be industry dependent, of course, because companies like wine or whiskey producers hold onto their inventory a long time. Whereas a grocery store, you expect it to turn over its inventory on a very regular basis because, you know, that lettuce is not going to sit around for weeks at a time. So the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory tells you how many times the company turned over its inventory during the course of the year. 
The accounts receivable turnover then is credit sales divided by the average accounts receivable. Same concept, how often did it turn over its accounts receivable, billing and collecting from its customers? For a lot of companies, the credit sales is quite obvious. If they're a business to business company, then virtually all of its sales will be credit sales. But for a company like Apple, it's a little more difficult to figure out what the credit sales are. You have to go digging in the notes to try to figure out what proportion of its revenues are sold on credit to business customers and what proportion were sold for cash to consumers. So that information may or may not be easy for you to obtain in the financial statements, but just don't be naive. Don't just assume that the total revenue is all going to be credit. Dig and find out. The accounts payable turnover is a little more nuanced, a little more complicated to calculate because there is no particular line on the main financial statements that you can look at and say, oh, that's credit purchases. So what you've got then is you're trying to figure out what did the company buy from its suppliers and how often did it pay off those debts to the suppliers during the year? The credit purchases in the numerator here is a little tricky to calculate. You start with the cost of goods sold. And th there is your first problem right there because cost of goods sold includes uh, expenditures on building up the value of the inventory that were not purely payments to suppliers. Right? So the wages of the people who constructed the inventory would be included in the cost of goods sold, but they wouldn't be included in accounts payable. So that's something to keep in mind right there. But you do start with the cost of goods sold as an approximation of the purchases during the year. And then you adjust that by the change in inventory. So you need the cost of goods sold figure, you need the beginning inventory, and you need the ending inventory in order to calculate this. So how does the calculation go? Let's start with the situation where the cost of goods sold was say a thousand for the year and the beginning and ending inventories were 100. So there's been no change in inventory. And that means that the, the company sold $1,000 worth of inventory during the year, and it must have purchased exactly the same amount because the inventory is unchanged. So in that case, the cost of goods sold is the credit purchases. Now imagine that the company had started with zero inventory. Then during the year, it would have purchased the $1,000 worth of cost of goods sold, plus it would have purchased another $100 worth of inventory because inventory went up from zero to 100. So you can see that any increase in inventory has to be added to the cost of goods sold. And conversely, if there's a decrease in inventory from the beginning of the year to the end, then that should be deducted. That decrease should be deducted from the cost of goods sold in order to arrive at the credit purchases. So I suggest that you look at the Saputo calculations and try to figure out for yourself what the credit purchases were, and then you can figure out what the accounts payable turnover is. Here's what I've done for the calculation, and you can see that the inventory turnover is fairly stable. You're looking at a slight increase in the inventory turnover, so slightly more efficient at the end of the year compared to last year. The AR turnover is also a little bit higher. It's gone up from 12.9 to 13.4. So it's collecting more frequently from its customers, but the accounts payable turnover has also gone up. It's paying off its suppliers more frequently during the year as well. How do all of these things fit together in order to create an overall picture of how the company is doing? If they're all up, then it suggests that the company is being a little more efficient at all aspects of its operation, but it's worth trying to fit these together in some kind of a more meaningful calculation. And so that's what I'm going to show you next. One of the things that you have to face if your company is dealing with inventory and you're doing business to business sales and purchases is that you are going to be purchasing inventory from your supplier and you're going to then have it sitting in inventory. And at a certain point in time, you're going to sell it to a customer. And then you're going to have to wait a certain period of time to collect from the customer. Now, the problem is that you may have to pay your supplier before you collect from your customer. And so this is what's called a cash lag calculation. Again, it only makes sense for companies that do sell goods and that are business to business, but it's a really lovely calculation to do. So what are the components of it? Let's just look at, first of all, the number of days that the company has of inventory on hand. So that's how long it sat in inventory from the time that it purchased the uh, supplies from the supplier. And then how long did it take them to collect from the customers? And if you add those together, then that's the amount of time from the point that it purchased the supplies or the inventory to the point where it collects from the customer. And if you subtract from that, the number of days that it had between the purchase and the time that it had to pay the supplier, then you'll realize that there's a period of time here 
that would be what's called the inventory self-financing period of the company. That is the period of time that it has to come up with some sort of funds because the suppliers are not waiting patiently for their payment. They give you a certain amount of free credit, say for 30 days, but after that, you're going to have to pay them. You're going to have to come up with your own finances in order to pay for the inventory that has been sitting in inventory or has been sold and not collected on from the customers. What is each of these calculations? Well, we've already done the inventory accounts receivable and accounts payable turnover calculations on the previous slide. If you just invert those and divide the number of days in the year by the turnover, that will tell you on average how many days of inventory were sitting on hand. The same thing here, the number of days on average that it took you to collect from your customers, and then the number of days on average that you made your suppliers wait before paying them. And if you do the calculation for Saputo, here's what you learn. The number of days inventory on hand has not changed very much at all. And the average collection period has gone down a little bit. And the average payment period has gone down a little bit. When we looked at these calculations earlier, the turnover calculations, we were uncertain what the overall effect of these was. Now, by doing the cash lag calculation, you can find out that actually nothing has changed. Everything's happening a little more rapidly, but the cash lag has not changed a bit. So that, again, indicates that Sakudo is a pretty stable company, and if anything, is just getting a little tighter, a little better managed in its operations as time goes by. All right, how do we pull all of this together? We've done a lot of calculations and a lot of interpretation. What do you do to pull all this together into a persuasive argument about what the company is doing? We've looked at the various types of analysis that we can do. We try to use a deduction and compare that to using induction. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to think about what the company does and compare it to what you're seeing in the financial statements. And you are not going to be afraid of contradictions. You're actually going to celebrate when there's a contradiction that you've unearthed in the financial statements, contradiction between one piece of information and another, contradiction between what you thought might happen and what you saw happen. That's where you get something meaningful to say about the company. Once you've done all of this, you are going to present the results of all your calculations from those three different perspectives that I talked about. You want to be able to talk about the financial position of the company, the financial performance of the company, and the cash flows. The financial position of the company is largely the balance sheet. The financial performance of the company is not just the income statement, but the income statement in relation to the assets of the company and the equity of the company and the working capital of the company. And the cash flows, of course, you're going to be looking at in terms of the analysis of the cash flow statement and the various cash leg components that we were just looking at. You're going to draw on everything that you've done, the common size analysis, the trend analysis, and all the ratios that you've done. And you're going to interpret all of this stuff in relation to the context. The context matters. And then you're going to think about how do each of these components interact with each other? All of these things are clues to what you're seeing, and you need to compare them to each other to try and figure out what they mean. So pulling all of these together, you want to look at the performance of the company, the position of the company, the cash flows of the company within the context that it's operating. And that can be an industry context. It can be an economic context. It can be a strategic context. And uh, you want to look at all of these things and tie them all together. The important thing is to realize that these are not going to add up to one specific thing that you can conclude that they're all going to point to one conclusion. You're going to have contradictions. And again, you want to celebrate those contradictions because you'll be able to see, for instance, that the company is doing really well in terms of its performance, but you're maybe perhaps a little bit worried about its short-term cash flows. Or maybe it's doing well in the short-term cash flows, but you're worried that perhaps the company is over-leveraged. There's always going to be a perhaps that you want to consider as you are writing up your analysis. Don't be a monotonic. Don't just hit the same note over and over again. This is not the kind of report that is going to be improved by simply adding more cowbell. You do want to make sure that you reach a conclusion, right? However tentative, you want to make sure that you come to a clear conclusion. You know, as a result of my analysis, I think that we should or we should not go ahead with whatever decision we're trying to contemplate. Or as a result of this analysis, I think that this company is or is not a good investment. As a result of my analysis, I think that we should or should not lend to this particular bank customer. So your analysis is going to want to reach some sort of a conclusion, 
And then you can append to that the caveats. However, it is worth keeping in mind that X or Y about the company did cause us concern and further investigation of that might be warranted before committing to our decision. So that's how you go about writing it up. And I hope that all of this has helped you to understand not only how to do the calculations, but how to use them and how to interpret them. So what did we learn? We have looked at uh, annual reports and the whole idea of impression management. We've looked at how to reframe the financial statements, and we've looked at the concept of earnings quality. We've gone over all the calculations for common size, trend analysis, and ratio analysis. And we've talked about pulling it all together and writing it up and coming to a conclusion. It was a long set of slides and there's nothing can be done about that because financial statement analysis is complicated and nuanced. Enjoy the tools that you now have at your disposal and try to put them to use someday soon. Well, it's all about money, money, money. Ooh, money, money, money. Ooh, yeah. Dollar signs in.